come and have special events, and we love special events, so we take every excuse we can come up with. We're glad you're here with us today. Praise the Lord for that. Today I'd like to uh, look at Behold the Lamb from John the Baptist introducing the disciples to Jesus. From John chapter number 1, you just heard that read. As we walk through this life, our focus often just changes from one thing to the next thing. It's from you know, one fad to the next, from one crisis to the next. And it leaves us vulnerable to all kinds of misinformation, misguided beliefs. We end up missing that which is most important. It's very easy to do. It's part of our human nature. When what we all really need to learn to do is focus on that which is most critical for life. But as humans, we're often what, distracted, blinded, if you will, by the glitz and the glamour of the world. And in addition to that, the Bible says that Satan blinds the minds of those who believe not on Jesus Christ. So in addition to a sinful nature we all carry that is selfish and and, uh, likes to follow after lies, the father of lies, the devil, the prince of the power of the air, he is also constantly bombarding you and I and worse, the lost world, with all of these lies about eternal things. This is one of the reasons that we need to learn as believers to keep our eyes and our lifestyles focused on Jesus. So that we, as John the Baptist here in this passage of Scripture, can powerfully point other people's eyes and hearts toward Jesus. Because He is the most important thing that any human will ever focus on, will ever come to know. In verse number 29 of John chapter number 1, it says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And in verse 36, And looking upon Jesus... As he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. Father, as we come before you today, we pray that you would be lifted up and glorified, not only in this moment, but in every moment, Lord, of our lives as believers. We pray, Lord, that for everyone that is here without Jesus, who doesn't know Jesus as Savior yet, Lord, that today your Holy Spirit would draw them to you that they would come to know their soul's greatest need is Jesus and forgiveness of sin. For each of us who are believers, Lord, that we would, you would convict us, Lord, of those things, those areas of our lives where we're so easily distracted. We get wrapped up in things that don't really matter. And we let others go on without knowing you as Savior, without even sharing the hope of Jesus in their lives. Lord, show us the way. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. When it begins in this passage of Scripture, John the Baptist says, Behold. What he's saying here is he's saying, Fix your eyes upon. Fix your heart upon. This is the guy that you need to come to recognize. It is in an imperative mood, which simply means It's a command. He's telling his disciples, hey, that's the guy you need to be following. It is is an exhortation that you and I need to carry to the world to say, who you need to know is not me. You need to know Jesus. And that's what this is all about. The passage of Scripture in John 1, before this current one, it's where the Pharisees come to John the Baptist. And you know, he is a Nazarite. He's taken a Nazarite vow. He doesn't look like the rest of the people. He doesn't talk like them. He doesn't eat like them. He, you know, he's out wandering in the wilderness. And yet he has all these disciples. And they say, John, who are you? And he said, I'm nobody. He said, I'm just a messenger for Jesus. 
I'm a voice crying in the wilderness. Your Savior is coming. Amen. And that, that should be the goal of each of our lives as believers. To be that person that is preparing the way. Scripture talks about, and in Luke, about you know, taking down the rough places and filling in the low spots and making it easier for people to come to know Jesus Christ. And that's what our lives are supposed to do in our words. He says, it's not about me. It's about you getting to know Jesus. I'm just here to point you to the one that really matters. How much of our lives are dedicated to that? John made that his life, John the Baptist. He said, there is someone that you need to fixate upon. I know you're following me, and that's great, but he said, I'm not the guy that's going to save the world. That guy is, as he points to Jesus. Now, the world and the devil are trying to keep you from the truth. Our own nature draws us toward lies and sinfulness. The nature that you and I both inherited from Adam. Adam and Eve. The original sin. And it carries on into our lives. And we, you don't have to teach a kid to sin. You don't have to teach a kid to cry when there's nothing wrong. You don't have to teach a kid to say, I didn't do it when you watch them do it, I mean, it's, it's in our nature. Amen. And it only gets worse from there as we grow up. And he says, the, the Scripture teaches us that you know, we need to be focused on making a personal contact with everybody we can in this world. He says, wait a minute, stay away from sinners. No, no, no. Sinners are our mission. Don't participate in their sin, but man, they need Jesus. Just like you and I needed Jesus before we came to know Him. Our job is to keep speaking the truth and living the truth into the ears of the non-believers. Living it before them so they see its benefit. Speaking it so that they can come to know Him because Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto Myself. So our job is to lift Him up. Let the world know that He is the answer. And today, if you're here without Jesus, we want you to know that we're not going to stop praying for you. And at every opportunity we have, we're going to continue to reach out to you. And if somebody invited you here today and you don't know Jesus, that's probably why they invited you today. So that you could meet Jesus. That's important. Don't take it as they think less of you. Take it that they care enough to share the answer to all of life's sin. The problem that we have, you and I as believers and the lost world, is that too many times we're looking for the wrong Savior. That happens all the time. We fixate on something that is not going to make the difference that needs to be made. And part of that is because people fear the wrong tyrants in life. If you'll recall... You know, Jesus was coming into town just one week prior to the, you know, to his uh, crucifixion and resurrection, okay? And the people were shouting and crying, save, save us. We also saw how it tied into scripture that said, make us wealthy, but that wasn't the answer. And I know that you, the people of the first century that were there, want some political or economic or some social savior. But that's not going to do it. That's not where the real problems lie, and that's not where the answers are. Amen. You know, many people, the first century believers, believed that it was those 
horrible, awful, wicked Romans that had taken over their country. And you may be saying it's those those terrible, evil Democrats or Republicans or the rich or the poor or this racial group or some media problem or some religion in life, and they're our world's biggest problem. And that's wrong. It's not. The problem with every one of those groups is the same. Sin. Whatever your flavor of the day is that you want to hate on or fixate on to think it's the answer to life, if it's not Jesus, it's wrong. People point and they say, look, it's that group that's keeping us from financial success. It's that group that's that's, uh, keeping me from a life of leisure or taking away my liberty or... You know, and you hear all these words all the time. But the real slave master is sin. People today are misled, they're blinded to their real need, just like the first century believers were. There's nothing new under the sun. Wisest man that ever lived said that, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And it's still sin. The issue that you need to ask yourself, first of all, is do I misunderstand my own greatest need? The world out there does not realize that the worst thing, the greatest danger that they face is something that is inherent and natural in their life. It's sin. And there is only one answer for sin, and that's Jesus. You can be as religious and dedicated as you want, but if you don't know Jesus, you're going to pay the penalty for your sin. And the penalty for sin is death, eternal death, and damnation and fiery torment. You don't even get the benefit of annihilation. Now, for our human minds, that is... I believe, impossible to fully comprehend. And then to take it and understand that that is actually justice. That's actually right. God doesn't make mistakes. And so here we are focused on politics or focused on climate or focused on Uh, you know, some particular group or some freedom or lack of freedom, all these things. And it doesn't make those things wrong. They need to be right. And if our hearts are right with God, we're not going to be causing all these problems. We're not going to be destroying the earth. He told us to take care of it. We're not going to be hating each other. He told us to love one another. We're not going to be taking advantage of each other because he told us to treat one another like brothers and sisters in the Lord and to, you know, if, you're, if someone wants your uh, cloak, he says, give them your shirt too. Someone's angry with you, strikes you, he says, turn the other cheek. I mean, there's a whole lot of things that the Bible teaches. But all of those are secondary to having your sins paid for. In John chapter 3, the same book that we're in, Verse number 17, it says, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world. That's not why Jesus came. But that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because, listen to this, this is the reason, He hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. You could say, well, that sin was a long time ago. I didn't know any better, all of those things. But here in this verse, it says, this is the condemnation. That light, Jesus, is come into the world. And men love darkness more than they love light. How many of us 
like our sin and like our attitudes and like to get angry about things when our job is to let other people know about the love and the grace and the mercy and the hope of Jesus Christ. It says that they love darkness more than light because their deeds were evil. Now, you and I know in our own lives and in the lives of all these people that we see, in our own minds, we can justify just about any behavior. It's their fault. I'm not as bad as them. Well, it's okay. God would want me to have this. There's a lot of things in our lives that we find a way to justify even though we know God says they're wrong. Why is that? Because sin is the slave master. We want what we want. And what we want when we take our eyes off Jesus is almost always wrong. Jesus should be our focus. He'll create a right heart, renew a right spirit in me, right? Sin is the slave master, and everlasting torment is the end. There's no good thing that comes out of sin. There is no good reason to do wrong. Ever. The one who lived this life to perfection never once had a bad attitude. Never once made a wrong choice. We just need to do right and trust that God will bless it. We look at life and we think more money, extra overtime, fixing something else in my life, getting, you know, getting some change in my life is going to take care of all my problems. That can't happen. We're sinful beings living in a sin-cursed world under the rule and reign, if you will, of the devil himself. Everything, even the laws of nature, say that everything is decaying. Everything is going toward disorder and chaos. That's why we need to focus on Jesus the creator and sustainer of all things, the giver of life, the one who is love, the one whose mercy is everlasting, whose grace is sufficient. All of these wonderful things. But where do we put him on our list? God sent a lamb. The people there in Jerusalem, they wanted, they wanted a Savior that would come in on a white stallion with a sword in his hand, killing every Roman in his path. Making them rich, making them wealthy in every sense, giving them freedom like they'd never known before. And here comes Jesus in on a little donkey. A young one, even. As humble as you can get and still be riding. That's not what they wanted. So within a week, they're saying, crucify him. He's not going to give us what we want. Nobody is there to take care of what you need and give you everlasting life. God sent the, the lamb. He sent a lamb. Behold, the lamb of God, Jesus. The lamb throughout all of, bio, of the Bible is a symbol of the atoning sacrifice. Under the Old Testament, the, the, the lamb would be sacrificed. There were other sacrifices if you could not afford that, but the, the lamb would be sacrificed to cover up sin until the perfect sacrifice came. That's Jesus, of course. And Jesus came in the flesh so that He could shed His blood. The Scripture says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission, no removal of sins. 
Now, under the Old Testament law, that sacrifice would be made and sin would be covered so that they could worship God and have God in their midst in the Holy of Holies over the Ark of the Covenant. But it was just a covering. But without the shedding of blood, there's no removal, no remission of sins. You're still guilty, just, okay, we're not going to hold it against you yet. But when Jesus came, He came in the flesh so that He could shed His blood. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth, and spirits don't bleed blood, right? But God said blood's required. So Jesus had to take on flesh. First of all, it helped prove that He was different than everybody else. He lived His entire life without a bad attitude, without sinning, without doing the wrong thing. Did He get angry? Yes. He got a whip out a couple of times and ran people out of the temple. Okay, But it was always the right thing to do at the right moment for the right reason. He lived this perfect life. And going through life humbly as He did, He still took time for the needs of everyone around Him. He respected His mother. He did what she asked. When somebody was sick, He would heal them. He raised the dead. He walked on water. He did all kinds of things that nobody else could do. And He did it all with a right heart, a right attitude, proving that he was different than any other human that had ever lived. And he did all of that to show you that he was God come in the flesh so that he could suffer and bleed and die to fulfill the Scripture that you might have your sins removed, completely removed from all the records in heaven. What an amazing thing. Jesus paid the price. He paid the price in full. And even though we read that He took, came to take away the sin of the world, in 1 John 2.2 2 it says, and He, Jesus, is the propitiation. That single article that says, and when He says this is the propitiation, He is the only one, not a, not one of many. He is the propitiation. And that propitiation means payment acceptable. There was only one payment acceptable, and that was the blood of the perfect Lamb of God, Jesus. That's why He came. He'll come again with power and great glory. He will come and He will be a secular leader as well as a religious leader. He will sit on the throne for a thousand years and rule and reign with a rod of iron and yet in perfect peace. But that's not why He came the first time. And when He comes to meet us in the air, it's only going to get worse for a little while. He is that King of kings that everybody wants Him to be. But He had to take care of business first. And the one thing that mattered more was people. The only way we can be with Him is to have our sins paid for. To receive Him as our Savior. He is the propitiation for our sins. And not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus didn't die for a select few from a particular group. When John the Baptist introduced him, he said, this is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. When John is writing about him in the, the, the first John in chapter 2, he says, but also for the sins of the whole world. In John chapter 3 and verse 16, which most of you are familiar with, it says, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Well then, why isn't the whole world saved? Because God left the job of letting them know that Jesus saves 
up to you and to me. Now you and I look at that and say, that's a mistake, God, except the fact that we know God doesn't make mistakes. But how are we going to share that with people when all we do is whine and complain, when all we do is say, oh, woe is me, when all we do is want what a sinful world has and then try to tell them that Jesus is the answer to everything? Sounds like another lie in their mind. This same Jesus that came and suffered and died was buried. He also rose again from the dead. And He will return. In Luke 24, 6, the angel said, He is not here, but He is risen. He's alive. That's the whole point. And that's what we celebrate today. Among all the religions of the world who have had a Savior to come to them, Christianity, true biblical Christianity, is the only one with a Savior who has conquered death and lives today. There's none other like Jesus. Revelation 5.12 says that they're singing in heaven and saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And it goes on. And that's who Jesus is. The whole thing about it is, that's who He is, but He left you and I to let the world know that that's who He is. And so what's our job? To go around trying to look like the world, act like the world, get what the world's got to give? No. To live for Jesus, to look like Jesus, to love like Jesus, to forgive like Jesus, so that we can say, look, this is the difference maker. It's Jesus. It's not even me. I'm just the recipient of the blessing of it. And no matter what I have or don't have, I have the joy of the Lord, the hope of God. I can rejoice in these things. I have peace with God. And I can have peace with people around me if they'll let me. Because I have what I need in Jesus. I don't have to pursue all those things. I don't have to believe all those lies. I don't have to try to justify something in my life. When you're caring about somebody, you don't, they don't need justification for that. They just need to know that it's real. And if you're going to reach them for Christ, it may take a while for them to learn to trust that what you have is worth having very important. John here playing the role of leading Jesus into his ministry here on the earth said, Behold the Lamb. For you and I who are believers, essentially that's our job. We live, we love, we forgive, we we act with mercy and grace. We hold the truth as important. We don't get distracted, frustrated, and turned aside by every lie of this world. We don't have to have everything that everybody else in this world has. And we can live with joy and hope and peace and comfort and love people whether they love us or not. At some point, they're going to realize that what the world's offering is just a trap, just another sin. And they're going to come, and they're going to say, what is it that you have? And you're going to say, Jesus, it's not me. I'm not a better person. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I'm just blessed to know Jesus. If you're here today without Jesus, there's much of this that I've just spoken of that you can't even get your head wrapped around. The Bible says you can't without the Holy Spirit. You can't have the Holy Spirit without accepting Jesus Christ. Now, He may be calling to your heart right now and telling you, I'm lacking something. I'm short somewhere in my life. Something that I sincerely need. 
That may be God saying you need Jesus today. As we prepare to sing and take the Lord's Supper, I'll ask you, if you're in that state, if you're not sure, turn to someone near you or step out and come. We'll have someone show you from the Word of God. Not some doctrine of joy or Baptist that that we've made up, but we'll show you from God's own Word how that you can know Jesus and know that you're saved and have that joy and peace with God. Christian, one of the things that we're supposed to do before we receive the Lord's Supper and celebrate Jesus is we're supposed to have our, right, our hearts right with God. And if you can't love the people out there in the world, no matter who they are, no matter where they come from, no matter what they've done, there's something wrong in your heart. That's sin. And we need to get it right. I believe time is short. There are nearly 8 billion people on this earth. Most of which don't know Jesus. The vast majority. They need us to say, behold. Hey, look at that. That's what matters. Jesus. Jesus. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we pray.